Today, we're here with Helen Cheng, and she is a PhD candidate at Northeastern University, and she's also the Margaret A. Davidson Graduate Fellow with the Wells Reserve, and she's been doing lobster research, also research on blue crabs and black sea bass, and today she's going to be sharing with us what she's been finding. So Helen, take it away. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you everybody for, for making this uh, webinar. I'm sorry I couldn't be up there today. I need to, the rain got to Boston. I'm based in Boston currently, um, and I was a little nervous about driving in the foul weather, but I'm excited to share some of the research that I worked on with the Wells Reserve this summer, as well as aspects of my PhD research at Northeastern University. So today I'm going to be sharing a tale of three estuaries from the perspective of the American lobster, an emerging story of lobsters and range expanding species in the Gulf of Maine. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about my role at Wells Reserve and the fellowship that I'm part of. So the Margaret A. Davidson Fellowship is dedicated to Margaret A. Davidson, who was a visionary in coastal management um, and really pushed the limits on innovation of coastal management, researchers, and working with communities. Um, so she's honored by NOAA, the National Ocean, uh, sorry, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, a federal agency working on ocean and coastal issues. Um, and the Davidson Fellowship is doing collaborative research with um, the 30 reserves, as, as Suzanne mentioned, across the country. And I'm based, uh, I'm hosted with Wells Reserve working in the research sector with Dr. Jason Goldstein. And it's to help, in, to help scientists and communities understand coastal challenges that may influence future policy and management strategies. So the talk for today's talk will be, um, is addressing um, fisheries coastal management um, strategies. As Suzanne mentioned, I am a PhD candidate at Northeastern University based in Boston, looking at um, uh, with a concentration in marine environmental sciences and a sustainability concentration. And I did my master's work very close by at the University of New Hampshire um, in zoology. And I looked at um, the American horseshoe crab um, in Great Bay estuary. So my research looks at the distribution and interactions between range expanding species of black sea bass and blue crabs with the American lobster. So before I talk about these species, I wanna talk about uh, a body of a geographic region we're all familiar with, the Gulf of Maine. And the Gulf of Maine is really special in that um, it is driven by many different environmental factors, especially by currents. As you can see from this map here, it sort of has a, um, uh, it's, there's high productivity and movement of water and it is heavily in, uh, influenced by different um, currents and ocean currents. And it also has its own sort of current that um, as you can see here, sort of influencing each other. So um, it's a very dynamic body of water. And because it's so dynamic, it can, it's, it's, fauna or its biodiversity is strongly influenced by these environmental influences. The Gulf of Maine is also heavily influenced by different watersheds and rivers that are feeding from our mountains and from the north out down to our estuaries and to our coast. And the big star here is where, where Wells Reserve is. So you can see from this figure, there are many different watersheds that drain their water from the mountains down to the coast. So there's you have your ocean currents, and you also have your watersheds that drive the Gulf of Maine and its biodiversity. So I wanna talk about a species that we know, lo love and, and know very familiar about. Um, we're all familiar with lobster, the American lobster as primarily this delectable dish to have during a New England summer. And the numbers show how popular lobsters are. Putting it all together, lobsters are a multi-million dollar industry, um, and a lot of that is founded in the Gulf of Maine. Um, in fact, the main driver, uh, main economic driver in for the state of Maine is due to lobsters. 
And lobsters support many different groups and local economies. I've listed some of them here. Um, and it is one of the most valuable fisheries in the United States and is desired domestically and globally. However, because of all our environmental influences in the Gulf of Maine, lobsters are uh, in hot water as shown by this heat map of sea surface temperature anomalies uh, in the Gulf of Maine. And so I'm gonna walk you through what this figure, this colorful figure is showing. So on the, hor the horizontal here, um, you have the months within a year. And on the vertical axis here, you have years. And the warmer the colors, the more reds, the more hotter the water in the Gulf of Maine gets, right? And so you can see within um, our recent years, uh, in the last 10, 20 years, and during our summer and fall months, there are a lot of reds. Um, which means that and and which means that our waters in the Gulf of Maine have been getting warmer and warmer. And which is why I say that lobsters are currently in hot water, because lobsters generally like cooler temperatures here. However, these warmer waters have brought new species into our regions, two of which I've laid out here: um, the black sea bass and blue crabs. And these two species have been found anecdotally in our in our um in the Gulf of Maine waters. And so I want to show what their known geographic um range is on the figure to uh the left. Um, the black lines show the known geographic range for black sea bass and the blue lines represent the known geographic range for, for blue crabs. However in recent years and even this right hand figure is out of date. Um, black sea bass and blue crabs have been found beyond uh, their known geographic range in northern Massachusetts and even mid-coast Maine. Um, and so this has caught the attention of a lot of scientists. Wells Reserve has, has picked up on this too and started to look at and uh, monitor um, specifically blue crabs at Wells Reserve. So I wanna talk a little bit about these two species of focus. These are not the only two species that are expanding their range, but they are generating a lot of interest and concern um, in relation to the American lobster fishery. So black sea bass, um, they are a temperate reef fish. They love to eat um, crustaceans like crabs um, and they like structured habitats. They like to hang around reefs and, and rocks and hard bottom. They conduct seasonal migrations, meaning that they come near shore during um, the warmer months and um, they migrate offshore during the cooler months. Um, this is a tough word for me to say, but this they are protagonist hermaphrodites, meaning that they change their sex throughout their life cycle. So they can start off as females and transition into males. Um, there is a commercial fishery for black sea bass, primarily in um, Massachusetts, and, but they are very abundant in the um, mid-Atlantic region using hook and line or pots. So our next range expanding species of focus is the blue crab. They are generalist predators and they like to hang around coastal and estuarine habitats like seagrass beds and oyster reefs. They are a very popular fishery in the US Mid-Atlantic in the Chesapeake region as indicated by these dollar amounts of commercial landings in Maryland and in Virginia. And oftentimes blue crabs are sort of the, um, anal uh, they're iconic to the Chesapeake Bay region. However, like I said earlier, these species have been seen to in our waters in the Gulf of Maine and I want to emphasize the Wells Research Reserve have been doing uh, long-term monitoring for blue crabs in the reserve since 2019. Um, they're also looking at their distribution and, and impacts to um, the, the Wells Reserve and to the marsh habitats here. And so I want to really emphasize that the work that I've been doing has been um, a complementary and piggybacking off of their pre-existing work even before I started my PhD. I also want to give a shout out to uh, Laura Crane, who's a research associate at uh, Wells Reserve, who has been leading the charge in the monitoring. 
And so the Wells Reserve have been setting out traps in the estuary since 2019, and it's been um, uh, uh, expanding over time and has drawn a lot of interest. I think there was a main public radio cast with Laura about Blue Crab Range expansion in Maine. So I encourage anybody to look for that radio cast of the of Blue Crab Range expansion. So I wanna give some real life photos of what these species look like and how they live within their habitats here. You can see that uh, um, black sea bass like these rocky habitats and blue crabs, um, this is a blue crab in a bucket, but can be very um, uh, voracious and very feisty, uh, especially if, if anyone has seen one um, in person. <laughs> so I wanted to introduce one of two projects that I worked with, with Wells Reserve. Um, the first project was looking at the interactions between these two range expanding species and lobster in a changing Gulf of Maine. And um, what I ended up look, I wanted to look for predator effects, which means who eats who, and competitive effects, which species will dominate over one over another, over a prey source. Uh, in this case, we had um, different experimental designs for this interaction experiment with lobsters and blue crabs, um, lobsters and black sea bass, and all three species in one tank over a prey source of mussels. And so this project, um, this tank experiment took place at the Northeastern Marine Science Center, where I set up these cylindrical tanks um, with these three species season one tank and looking at their behavior for 18 hours, um, capturing day and night activity. And you can see um, what the, the tanks look like during the daytime and what they look like during the nighttime. Look, ooh, I think, oh no, I just skipped the, okay. Well, let me just, my slides are out of order, but I wanna introduce some of our preliminary findings. Um, we know that uh, from our tank experiments that blue crabs are very feisty. They are direct competitors with um, when placed in a tank with a lobster and they are direct predators as indicated by this photo of a blue crab with a lobster tail in its stomach or in its mouth rather. And so what we ended up doing and finding these results and hopefully this will work is that this is what the overview looks like of our tank inside. And I just wanna orient you that there was a prey patch of mussels as the prey source for both, for all species. There's a lobster shelter for the lobster to hide into. Um, and the lobster was acclimated to the shelter um, for, uh, for at least two hours. And there's either a blue crab alone, a black sea bass alone, or two or both species in one tank. In this tank, it's just the blue crab and the blue crab is right in the middle here. So just to reorient you a prey patch to compete over, the lobster is right here in its shelter to hide in and a blue crab is running around in the tank. And so this is a video file of one of my tank experiments between lobsters and blue crabs. As you can see, the blue crab um, uh, annihilated really the prey patch. So there's nothing left on here. Generally, there would be a um, blue mussels in that prey patch, but it had finished it by the start of the experiment. So I'm gonna hit play. So as you can see, the blue crab approaches the lobster, the lobster comes out and there is a lot of mortality happening <laughs> as indicated by the blue crab capturing the lobster and pretty much throwing it around the entire tank. Um, and we showed this video to lobster fishers and their jaws dropped just knowing how brutal the, a blue crab could be to a lobster. So I'm gonna repeat the video again because I know it happened pretty fast. Um, so this is our first evidence of interactions between lobster and these and blue crabs as a range expanding species and could provide a snapshot of what um, if these species continue to enter the Gulf of Maine or when they will enter the Gulf of Maine, what their interactions would look like together. Okay. 
So I want to introduce the results of our other species, our black sea bass. And our main findings was that black sea bass are predators to lobsters, sort of. They seem to show what is called non-consumptive predatory effects, meaning that there's not really eating of the lobster, but sort of these fear factors for a lobster to be afraid of a black sea bass. And like I said earlier, black sea bass like structured habitats similar to lobsters. So um, there seems to be some sort of territorial behaviors happening with black sea bass. Um, and I'll show with my next video what that looks like. So in my next video, I will show um, a tank experiment with lobster and black sea bass only. Um, so there's a black sea bass right here. Um, the lobster is inside of, of its shelter. Um, you won't see the lobster in this video, but I guarantee you there is a lobster in there. And so I'll press play, but you can see the black sea bass lingers around its shelter and actually at one point sticks its head into the shelter. Um, and so that's an example of non-consumptive predatory effects where this predator is seeking, there's, knows that there's something inside the shelter and is actually seeking something out. So I'll play this video one more time um, and what these interactions look like. So you can imagine me analyzing a lot of these videos and watching a lot of these interaction videos. Um, and I'm happy to share some of my preliminary findings from this work. Um, so these are our four different experimental designs with our combinations of species on the, on the, on the horizontal axis here. And this is showing the number of exits of a lobster from its shelter. So how many times does it exit its shelter? And so you, it's interesting in that a lobster will exit its shelter more often than it does when it's by itself, um, more often in the presence of black sea bass than it would if it was by itself. And so these are really, this really, um, is a very interesting finding and I'm still trying to understand why that is. There's several hypotheses, but I think um, we know that there seems to be, um, there, there seems to be fewer uh, exits out of a shelter in the presence of blue crabs and in the presence of all three, but there seems to be more exits happening for the black sea bass by itself. The same result is true for the total number of minutes a lobster will make, will spend outside of its shelter. Um, and so again, a lobster will spend more time out of its shelter in the presence of black sea bass only compared to when it's when there's a blue crab in in the tank, when there's both species in the tank, and when it's by itself. Um, and so you guys are the first too and it's super fascinating and it springs more questions of what's to happen. I'm hoping to analyze more of my data this winter so I can share um, these data in the future. But it begs the question what is coming for the Gulf of Maine and for lobster in the presence of these two species? And so with my tank experiments we know that blue crabs can pretty much kill and annihilate a juvenile lobster. Um, but we also know that lobsters and black sea bass seem to coexist normally or well with each other. And so some further questions, I hope that this experiment um, aims to, to further ask is, is there something going on with densities? If we added more blue crabs in a tank with the lobster, would those behaviors change? Or is there some sort of site fidelity happening? So we gather these lobsters from um, New Hampshire, um, and our blue crabs are from Massachusetts, and our black sea bass is from Massachusetts too. So maybe there's some sort of recognition or not a recognition of these species, or they're not used to these species. Um, so I'm curious to dive into the literature more for these results. So I want to take my audience now from the lab laboratory, from our tank experiments, looking at the interactions, right? Because there's been more and more questions sprung from this work to the field. Um, and so my next question was looking at um, the distribution, abundance, and habitat characteristics for range expanding species, blue crabs and lobsters that are potential predators to uh, blue crabs and black sea bass 
that are present potential predators to, to lobsters. And so what we did was um, setting a field survey using lobster traps in different um, estuaries along New England and looking at uh, whether we can find blue crabs or looking and lobsters and finding um, any environmental influences on this work. So before I want to before I introduce this work, I want to thank everybody who was a part of this work, multi-state survey, um, the Wells Reserve, the Great Bay Reserve, and Plum Island folks. They really were a huge help to this. Um, and so I want to, before I introduce the work, I really want to thank all the partners that were part of this um, huge endeavor. So the three estuaries I will introduce to you are Wells Reserve. Um, Wells Harbor, like I said, is part of the National Estuarine Research Reserve in the state of Maine. Great Bay Estuary, also part of the National Estuarine Research Reserve based in New Hampshire. And the Plum Island Estuary in Massachusetts, which is part of the National Science Foundation Long-Term Ecological Research uh, Network. And so these trap surveys were looking at the distribution of these species along a latitudinal gradient from south to north, um, as well within the estuary, looking at a temperature and salinity gradient. We used um, recreational uh, lobster traps to capture what we um, what the distribution or what the species makeup are within these estuaries. And we set pairs of traps along four different sites uh, within the estuary. We, we soaked these traps for 24 hours using um, herring. Um, and we set these traps once a month from June to October. So it was a huge endeavor, like I said. And I want to, again, thank you, everybody who helped with this project. Um, so, get, so going into the main findings, we found lobsters in all three states, which was really exciting and really great. Um, we did not find blue crabs in these uh, estuaries, which could be a good or bad thing. Um, uh, however, the biggest finding was that we found a lot and a lot of green crabs in all three estuaries and all our sites within our estuaries. And I wanna dive into that data um, uh, for you all today. So I'm going to focus a lot of my data analyses within Wells Reserve, um, as well as introduce some of our other states too. So this is our sites on the, on the map here is where we set our traps within Wells Reserve. And one is the most saltiest um, and four is the most fresh um, that covers that salinity gradient. And so this figure here is the, um, average counts of each species within the sites within Wells Reserve. Um, our green line represents the average counts for green crabs. The orange line represents cancer crabs. So those are native crabs to, well, um, to New England, such as rock crabs and Jonah crabs. And the red line represents, or the red bar represents lobsters. As you can see, going from most salty to most fresh, we still see our native species like our cancer crabs and our lobsters, but we don't see our native species in these fresher environments. And the same holds true for green crabs. Green crabs tend to be in these more saltier environments and that's so, and it diminishes as you go from fresh. But if you compare the average counts between our native species and our invasive species, green crabs, there were way more green crabs um, at all our sites in well res Wells Reserve. Um, and so now I want to look across months of this survey work. So we, like I said, I conducted this work um, from June to October, and I wanted to capture what the temperatures and salinities look like um, over time within these estuaries or within this estuary. So the horizontal axis represents months. Um, this graph represents temperature, and this bottom graph represents salinity. And the different colors here from darker to light represents our different sites covering that salinity gradient. Um, our first graph, our temperature graph makes the most sense in that um, 
you know, it's warmer in the summer and it gets cooler in the winter time. Um, and even that was consistent across our different sites within the estuary. Our salinity story tends to be a little bit different. It seems to be very consistent over um, our th last three months here, um, but the same holds true as our most, our site one is our most salty site and our site four is our most fresh site. So looking at across our sites and given the environmental data I've shown, we can see that these trends, there seems to be some influence um, across the months uh, and across sites for our uh, species abundance. Um, so we definitely caught way more green crabs in October and in our most salty sites than other than previous months here. Um, and the reverse is sort of true for lobsters and for our native cancer crabs. We saw more lobsters in the beginning of our survey and then that dwindle, tw tw that decreased over time. Um, and then there seems to be a, sort of a mixed review for cancer crabs. All of these data are very, pol very preliminary as I'm still diving into it, but this just shows a snapshot of what Wells Reserve and what's, what's in Wells Reserve and what our abundances look like over time. So this is another figure here looking at the relationship between um, average counts of our species and um, temperature here. And so basically what I wanna, what, what I want my audience to focus on is sort of these trend lines. Um, for green crabs, as temperature increased, it seems that the average counts started to decrease. Um, so it shows that the warmer it gets, the fewer green crabs we get. Um, and that was sort of true in our most saltier sites. Um, and these numbers represent the strength of that relationship. So the higher the number closer to one, the, the stronger that relationship is. With lobsters, there tend to be not really a clear relationship between um, temperature and abundances. And this, these, days are, these data analyses are still going on, um, but I find it really interesting that there seems to be a relationship with temperature and green crabs. And so I want to now broaden our horizons to our latitudinal gradient and what these surveys look like across our three states. And so this is a repeat figure for Wells, Maine. Um, in, in Great Bay, New Hampshire, we saw nothing but green crabs. Um, you can see by the, our abundances here, we saw some cancer crabs. Um, we did catch one or two uh, lobsters, but did that didn't show in these figures just because we took our averages. Um, and there seems to be the same sort of uh, relationship happening with Massachusetts, maybe less so green crabs um, compared to New Hampshire and Maine. Um, but I find it really interesting that despite like these estuaries across different states, um, there are different relationships happening. So again, these data are ongoing, but it's really exciting to share these preliminary results. And so some of our preliminary findings, like I said, we found lobsters in all three states. Um, we did not find blue crabs. However, there have been anecdotal evidence that blue crabs have been found in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, I didn't include here, and Maine. In fact, our Wells Reserve staff with their uh, long-term um, monitoring program, they found blue crabs in well, Wells Reserve. But I think the biggest finding here is that we know that green crabs are pretty much overwhelmed in all three states. And this is a video of our one of our traps just dominated by green crabs here. Um, and so there are several hypotheses as to why that is, maybe because like green crabs are just taking over or just being are just so overabundance that it didn't leave. Um, room for our native species to enter the trap and grab the baits. Um, but to be able to calculate and find these um, findings has been really exciting. Just wanna be mindful of time here. Um, so just so some food for thought from this work. Again, all of these data are really a preliminary, but it makes you wonder about what's happening in our Gulf of Maine. Um, we know that there's changes in food web dynamics. As these species start to move their way northward, it's going to change who eats who. 
Um, and so we know that there's direct um, uh, consumption and predatory effects with our two focal main, uh, range expanding species. And this in turn can affect our local fisheries as well. Um, uh, and we know that there's evidence of these species overlapping with lobsters. Um, like our trap surveys have found, we found both lobsters in our tank uh, in our traps, and people have found blue crabs in their traps um, outside of this work. And so it also asks begs to ask the question: We know that there's in these estuaries, but are they crossing paths with each other? Um, and so that's a future study that could happen. And what is the interaction between group green crabs? Again, all three estuaries have seen green crabs, a lot of green crabs. And how does this affect um, not only lobster, but also these range expanding species coming in? And I like this figure here because it shows how the Gulf of Maine biodiversity is changing with all our new species and existing species. And again, how the currents drive these changes as well. Um, and so I think this figure really shows what the, the Gulf of Maine is, how it's changing and what it could look like. And with these work, it, there's management implications and decisions as us as users, as fishers, as consumers of these species. And so one question is, are we keeping up with a changing ecosystem? We know that the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of our world's oceans. And with that warming changes what are, what are in our waters. Um, and estuaries are one of the habitats that warm the fastest um, as well. So that, and estuaries are home to many um, uh, nursery habitats for these species. So that's where they grow up. So are we keeping up with these changing uh, conditions? These range expanding species, as we know that we're starting to see more and more of them, are they a threat or could they be an opportunity to open up new fisheries and relieve pressure off of our, our existing species too? Um, so it's a decision that we as a collective, as a community need to try to, uh, need to decide whether we should take, we should consider them as a threat or an opportunity. And what to do with our, uh, our green crabs. Um, we know that they're invasive. We, we've been finding them since the early 1900s. So, but because there's just so many of them, especially as demonstrated by our traps, what are we going to do with them? Um, there have been marketing efforts to use them as um, fertilizer, as bait, alternative bait, even as a, uh, as a beverage too. So, um, what are we going to do with these green crabs as they also are affecting our Gulf of Maine ecosystem? And I think the main driver or main point I wanna drive here is maintaining a balance, not having one species dominate over another um, and really considering how our, how our ecosystem is changing. And as humans being part of that ecosystem, what decisions are we going to make to be able to maintain that balance? Um, so with that, I want to give a big thanks to um, my research mentor at Wells, Dr. Goldstein, my advisor at Northeastern, John Grabowski, the Wells Reserve staff, including the research staff, um, the Great Bay staff who helped me with my survey work, um, Bart, who was uh, our uh, partner at Plum Island, uh, my lab, especially Nick and Lizzie, who were my in research interns this summer, um, my university, my car, which I was driving up and down New England to these uh, to do these work, and so many more people, um, and my funding sources from NOAA and Sea Grants. And with that, uh, I happy to take questions. Thank you, thank you, Helen. Yes, we do have some questions. Um, some came quite early on in your presentation. Um, the first one from Tom here, he's asking, does the size of the lobster matter? So I think I think that was when you were showing the video of the, um, the blue crab preying on the lobster. Yeah, I think, um, so I think that's a great question. Um, so for our tank experiments, we use juvenile lobsters. So lobsters that were um, 40 millimeters 
a carapace length or less. Um, but I do think size could matter, especially how big a predator's mouth could be. And I will add that the black sea bass that we used were sort of on the smaller size and could be the reason why maybe they weren't um, eating the lobsters. Um, so if I were to do the tank experiment again, I would probably try to use um, bigger fish. Um, the blue crabs that we used were adult size. So those are the biggest ones that we were able to find. Um, but I do think size could matter. I think purposely we chose juvenile lobsters because it's the stage before they enter the fishery. And so if we know that there's some interaction happening with juvenile lobsters, that can impact the lobster fishery. Um, Amy, your question was similar. Um, wondering, again, needing equal sized lobster and blue crab. So it sounds like that question was answered. Yes, Amy? Yeah, okay. Um, let's see, the next one from Tom, what effect would the green crab have? Um, hmm, did she answer your question, Tom? Um, yeah, sort of. We have issues with green crabs and, um, yeah, green crabs eating mussels and, and other species and they've been trying to do capture them the uh, clamors have been trying to capture them and i've noticed on tv several spot news newscasts on what they might try to do to use uh, green crabs commercially but i we've noticed that there's been a significant problem with them for especially for our clamors so yeah, and I think that's a really great point to make because um, as you saw, our our trap surveys were just overwhelmed by green crabs. Um, I didn't specifically use green crabs in my tank experiments, but there have been work to look at the interaction with green crabs and blue crabs over soft shell, uh, sorry, over mussels. Um, that data, I don't have access to that data that's been done by a another research partner. But I think you're absolutely right. Like what could happen with green crabs as well uh, with these species moving in? And so that's another question that people have um, been able to, or are starting to look at, like would blue crabs eat green crabs? Would it subdue the population? Will black sea bass eat the green crabs? So I think there's a lot more questions to ask with that can spawn from this work. Right, and that was the extension of my question. What how would the competitiveness shake out? Would that help our green crab problem by having other species eat them? But like you say, still more research. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But I'm not alone in this. There's so many other people who are working on this work. And so there's been a lot of discussion amongst each other being able to, to, uh, to assess this. But I think the big point is, is that these changes especially with range expanding species are happening very quickly and it changes from year to year. Um, I think um, especially this summer, it, it was rainy, it was warmer earlier. And so um, I know folks were starting to see blue crabs in their estuaries even before I started this work too, um, this season. So it's being able to keep up with, um, with the changes that are happening. Uh, let's see, and Jason. Oh, sorry, Tom. I was just saying thank you for the answer. Okay, good. Um, let's see, Jason, our research director, uh, saying there's evidence for juvenile lobsters taking up refuge in shallow habitats like estuaries and eelgrass beds. And Helen, he was wondering your opinion on whether blue crabs may provide a stopgap on green crabs by preying on them. Um, I actually think I, I do. If, if blue crabs start to migrate up to, well, start to expand their range and become more abundant, I do think they could, um, uh, lessen the pressure or lessen how many blue, uh, green crabs are. However, not considering all the other implications to our other species in the Gulf of Maine, 
there was actually a photographer um, that posted a video on social media somewhere of a blue crab eating a green crab. And I'm happy to share that aside, but I do think it's possible that blue crabs, because they're just so voracious and general pre generalist predators, could prey upon green crabs and maybe lessen the, the pressure um, from green crabs. Related to that, Helen, Jason had a follow-up question. Um, is there any evidence, oops, is there any evidence of interactions between cancer crabs and blue crabs that you know of? I am not aware of that, um, uh, of interactions between those species, but I, I would say, especially in our estuarine waters, if, um, given environmental conditions of salinity and temperature, there could be some sort of interaction. But I know um, cancer crabs tend to be in more saltier and even colder environments as opposed to blue crabs. And so there could be some overlaps, especially um, maybe during seasonal migrations. Um, but I could suspect there could be some interactions between cancer crabs and blue crabs. Okay, let's see another question from Katrina. Um, thank you for your talk, Helen. I'm wondering if there are any lessons learned from south of the Cape where these four species are already co-occurring that might be different from what you would expect to happen here where the prey are predator naive. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I do think what's happening in southern New England with blue crabs and black sea bass and lobster and green crabs can provide a warning signal for the Northern Gulf of Maine. Um, if, our war if our waters continue to warm and these changes are occurring, um, and we know that it, it has already happened in Southern New England, I do think it provides sort of this, this signal to us, like maybe we should be more attentive and maybe be wary of what we can do to address it. Um, I don't, there's no way you can stop warming, right? On especially on a large scale, it's, it's how we can respond to it, whether it's through regulations or updated regulations, um, whether we should open a, a new fishery or not. Um, I think it's the decisions that we make based off of the lessons that we can learn from Southern New England, especially um, where lobster are on the decline and these new species are making are becoming more prevalent. Um, I'll use black sea bass as an example. Um, I did some survey work in Rhode Island um, looking at distribution of black sea bass and how it overlaps with lobster. And black sea bass are just dominating our waters in Southern New England, um, which can lead, and because black sea bass eat crustaceans, it can change the makeup of the, those waters there, including lobster, including our crab species. So seeing what's happening in our southern region and knowing that our waters are going to continue to change and, and warm could provide that signal for us to, to be able to respond. I don't see any other questions in the chat, but folks, um, feel free to just unmute yourself if you have a question that hasn't been answered yet. I think one thing I'll note, Suzanne, um, having the opportunity to work in these three different estuaries and these different projects have opened my eyes on just how the Gulf of Maine is just so dynamic and so different. Um, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to work in these three estuaries and provide what that perspective is. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, like in addition to um, these experiences of witnessing these estuaries, the, the, the state management boundaries, the regulations um, are all very different. Um, and so you can imagine like the logistics behind um, this work. So I want to I want to acknowledge that as well. Are there any other questions from the group? I have one. Sure, sure. go ahead. Are blue crabs edible? 
Yes, they are edible. Um, they are very, they're very popular to eat in the mid Atlantic region, like the Chesapeake Bay, um, area. And, um, I personally like eating blue crabs over lobster in my opinion, but they are edible. Yes. Do you catch them the same way? I've heard you can dangle bait on a fish hook or a line and catch crabs down in the Chesapeake Bay area. Is that possible up here? Yeah. So um, in southern New England, they use um, you can't set traps for them um, uh, in some areas. So generally they'll use um, uh, uh, bait sometimes using chicken bait and setting up, uh, leaving them off on the side and they'll grab it. And that's how a lot of um, people usually catch blue crabs there. Handline, yeah. I guess if it's possible to eliminate them or reduce their numbers by so-called fishing for them, um, maybe that's a way that could help change the ratio of the populations and i don't know if it'll help the lobster i don't think it's worth sacrificing lobsters in the sake of blue blue crabs or or anything else but uh, if there's some way it could be managed and it might take an awful lot of work might not even be possible but just my sense worth yeah i agree i think it's understanding like do we do we think of these as a new opportunity because they are very popular in other regions? But then what about lobster and lobsters iconic? It's such a tradition to this region. So uh, a lot of it really is how we view them, right? And how um, in doing this work and doing this research, what it could look like um, for the future of the Gulf of Maine. Um, I think. I think Amy had her uh, microphone unmuted. Yes, she did. <laughs> did you have a question, Amy? Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I lived in uh, Maryland for 50 years. And um, just to reiterate that blue crab is such a big business there. It's multi 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 million dollar business and well sought after year round um <clears throat> my my good concern is we don't i hope we don't just look at this from a which predator will eat which predator and how can we keep that from happening i'm just you know i look at it from a more holistic view uh -huh. um does your research include well these are changes going on um do we as humans have to intervene in this in this change, or do we see what settles over twenty years? Um, that is that's that's a great segue. So a lot of my PhD work um, is looking at the social impacts of these range expanding species, and I've actually interviewed commercial lobster fishers about the the impacts of range expanding species. A lot of um, and it from region to region. So I looked from Southern, um, from Cape Cod all the way up to down East Maine, um, sending out surveys. And there seems to be um, sort of a mixed review on whether or not black sea bass uh, specifically could impact lobster fishers, as well as whether they want to take uh, an opportunity on these new species mm -hmm. as a potential fishery. And I think a lot of the results that we got from our, our northern Gulf of Maine fishers are very much like we have been fishing for lobsters for, for as a tradition. It's like this is what we only do here. Um, and these are areas that don't see that many black sea bass yet. But I wonder, I wonder the same thing, like could if they start to see these species more and more, is that and and lobsters getting harder and harder to catch, could those mind shifts change? Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it's it's really interesting to look on it from the human side too, right? Because they are a big role in this ecosystem as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a question for Helen. Uh, <clears throat> what, uh, 
What motivated you to get started on this whole line of research? It's very fascinating. I think you did a great job. But oh, thank you. <laughs> how is it? How is it you got started? What What motivated you? Yeah, so I didn't I allude to this, but I'm actually uh, from New York City, <laughs> and so you wonder how a city girl gets into marine biology. Um, but really, a lot of um, uh, during my graduate work, I worked on horseshoe crabs, and um, I was in a lab that also worked on lobsters. And I think that drove me to kind of shift gears on a different fishery. Um, and so knowing that these changes are happening in the Gulf of Maine because of these new species kind mm -hmm. of fascinated me. Um, and the human side of it too, drew from my work um, previous to my PhD, I worked in New York City on coastal hazards and how that affected people. So I wanted to meld those two, um, two interests together in looking at the social and ecological side of, of um, these new species in the Gulf of Maine. And so I guess I've always had my roots in the Gulf of Maine and New England. Um, and I really love fish and crustaceans. And so that drove me to do this work along with a lot of great um, colleagues and mentors, Jason being one of them, um, how I got into lobsters. Great job innovating many different aspects. Yes, good. Thank you, that means a lot. <laughs> All right, let's see. We do have a couple more minutes if there are any lingering questions for Helen. All right. Well, um, Helen, did you want to mention the, the April possibility to folks? Yeah, so again, I apologize for not being there in person, but I also would love to be able to share more of my data and research in person. So I'm, I'm working with Suzanne to schedule an in-person um, lunch and learn seminar uh, in the springtime. So hopefully I will have more data as well as share some of my social uh, research as well. So we have that to look forward to. More details coming. We'll keep you posted on the website and in our email emails out to people. But oh, Tom says with <laughs> samples. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. It depends. <laughs>